If I mention the words truth or consequences, what does that make you think of? The old TV show, right? Okay. There was an old game show. It actually began on the radio. And it became the first televised game show back in 1950. I wondered if anyone would know that as well. There is a city called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, and believe it or not, those two are connected. Back in March of 1850, Ralph Edwards, who was the creator of the show, announced that he would air the program on its 10th anniversary from the first town that renamed itself. And Hot Springs, New Mexico, won that honor, officially changing its name to Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And if you look on a map, it's still that to this day. And because of that, they aired their 10th anniversary show from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. For a time, Edwards hosted the show on both radio and television, but eventually he turned the TV show over first to Jack Bailey for one year and then to Bob Barker, and he hosted the show for two decades. He ended each episode with a phrase, hoping all your consequences are happy ones. And the premise of the show was to mix the original quiz element to the game shows with wacky stunts. And I'm sure they're probably on YouTube. You could probably find old, uh, old copies of, of that game show. I bring it up tonight, not because we're going to play a game, but my title for my message is a variation on that phrase. It's truth or circumstances. Rather than a fun game to play, it's a serious question about how we approach life. Our text this evening is Luke 24, beginning in verse 13, what Leon Morris calls a charming story that is one of the best loved of all the resurrection narratives. It's also been captured in a famous painting, you've probably seen it, of three individuals walking along the road, and the, the portrait is called The Road to Emmaus. And it comes from this text this evening. I want to begin tonight with the discouraged saints. Luke introduces us to two followers of Jesus. In verse 13, now that same day, so this is still Easter Sunday, that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. In many of the scriptures, they're called disciples. They were not two of the twelve disciples. Jesus had many other disciples besides the twelve. In fact, one of them is named here. Um, verse 18 identifies one as Clopas, uh, and some suggest that perhaps the other was his wife Mary, who had been named elsewhere in the Scriptures. But whoever the other one was, we're told in verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Verse 17 says, they stood still, their faces downcast. Here were a couple of discouraged saints. Now Luke describes their conversation as bantering ideas back and forth with great emotion, trying to find answers. When Jesus asked, what are the matters you're discussing? Luke uses a term which literally means to throw back and forth. Have you ever been in a, a conversation where you're tossing ideas around? That's the idea here. They're trying to figure out what just happened. Over these last three or four days, the world has been turned upside down, and they're trying to make sense of it. They desperately wanted to know why their expectations of the Messiah had come to such a tragic end. And they're exploring a number of theories. We're not told what they were, but I'm sure they were bouncing ideas uh, off of each other. And suddenly the pair is joined by another walker they didn't recognize. Now, you all know who it was, but let's play along, okay? The newcomer says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And Luke says, they stood still, their faces downcast. 
We get the picture. They stop dead in their tracks. They're looking at this third traveler like he just stepped off of a spaceship. What are you, from Mars? You don't know what's going on? I mean, you climb out from under a rock? Everybody's talking about this. How could you not know what's happened over the last few days? Luke records the exchange. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he said. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was going to be the one that would redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of, the, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. We get the impression that these two were discouraged, They were disappointed because God had not done what they wanted him to do. They had great plans for this Jesus of Nazareth, and none of them came to pass. They thought he was going to ride in on a white horse and kick out the Romans and reestablish Israel as a powerhouse. And it didn't work out that way. And they're trying to figure out, how did we miss it? You see, the real problem wasn't in their heads, it was in their hearts. They could have discussed the subject for days and never arrived at a satisfactory answer. And the problem was, they didn't believe. They'd been told. The women came back and said, the tomb is empty, Jesus is not there. And angels appeared to us and said, he is risen. Don't you remember he told you that this was going to happen? And like Thomas, these two didn't believe. They're trying to figure out some other explanation. Something else must have happened. Because if these two had believed Jesus was alive, they would have behaved differently. Now, they weren't the only discouraged saints that day. John 20, verse 19, records that Most of the twelve, not all, we know that at least Thomas and Judas Iscariot weren't there. They were locked in the upper room for fear of the Jews. I'm sure their mindset were just like these two on the road to Emmaus, thinking, we thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah. He was going to reestablish Israel. What happened? They have locked the doors because they were afraid that the Romans would come and drag them off and they would be next on the cross. Notice what they said here. We hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. Their hope was something in the past. It was gone. Jesus was dead and with him died their hopes. In Mark 16, verse 14, it says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. You get the impression here, Jesus is a little ticked off with the disciples. Again. Seriously? You're not going to believe? I mean, how many times did I tell you this was going to happen? And then when others came who said they've seen it, you still don't believe. It suggests that the condition of their hearts had something to do with the expression on their faces. You see, the Gospels represent the disciples as being totally unprepared for Jesus' death. For them, it was an unexpected event. It was a tragedy, and and it left them in emotional shock. I mean, how could this be? How many times in the Gospel did Jesus predict that he would die? I mean, down to detail. John tells us that at one point he said when the Son of Man is lifted up, he was even telling how he would die. 
that he would be crucified by the Romans because that's what it meant to be lifted up in those days. You were lifted up off the ground, nailed to a cross to die. Jesus told them time after time after time. Remember after the, the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, Peter, James, and John are with Jesus and suddenly he's glorified right before them. Moses and Elijah come back and are talking to him, you know. And, and there's Simon Peter. Even when he doesn't know what to say, he says something anyway. He says, hey, let's build a monument to the three of you. And the, the father's voice comes out and says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And the other two disappeared. Remember what happened right after that? Right after that amazing experience, Jesus comes down and he starts telling the disciples, now listen, the leaders in Jerusalem are going to arrest me and they're going to have me killed, but on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. And Peter says, no way, that's never going to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Remember that exchange? All that's gone after Jesus died. They don't remember any of that. Or maybe they don't believe it. Maybe it's not a matter that they don't remember. It's a heart issue. It's unbelief. They had a whole different idea of what God's plan was going to be. And when that didn't materialize, they're ready to chuck it all. You know, they're thinking the Messiah was going to come as God's great king. The truth, as they saw it, didn't fit the circumstances. And that's why they were discouraged on this greatest day of history. So these discouraged saints were encountered by a distinguished stranger. Luke lets us in on a little secret in verses 15 and 16. It says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. On this occasion, they were prevented from recognizing Jesus. To them, he was just an ordinary man walking along the road who joined them on their journey. Only later, when God opened their eyes, did they know who it was. And this happens down in verse 28. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus acted as if they were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? True to cultural hospitality, the pair invited Jesus to stay. In fact, Luke says that they urged him strongly. And so he sits down with them. And in the, one of the most common actions of that day, it says that he broke bread. And then their eyes were opened. One simple act, and it all comes together. It all makes sense. The Greek phrase usually says, or translated, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It means they were completely opened and they came to fully comprehend him. They knew it was Jesus. The light bulb went on. <laughs> oh, that's who we're talking to. And as soon as they recognized who he was, he vanished. It all made sense. Jesus was the Messiah. But he didn't come to conquer the Romans. He came to conquer death. And he had indeed done that. So they hightail it back to Jerusalem, where they found a group of believers gathered in the upper room. They excitedly exchanged stories of seeing the risen Christ. And then suddenly Jesus appears in their midst, saying, Peace be with you. It's the word in Hebrew, shalom. It was a very typical greeting of that day. The need for a greeting of peace is seen in their reaction to Jesus' appearance. Look down to verse 37. 
Verse 36, when they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be unto you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. John also records this uh, appearance of Christ in John 20, verses 19 and 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, meaning Easter Sunday, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Why would he show him his hands and side and feet? Because the marks were still there. Proving that it was truly him. Proving it wasn't a ghost because he could eat. It wasn't a phantom. It wasn't a hallucination. And you know, there are people today that still try to sell this idea that um, the disciples ate some kind of magic mushrooms and had a hallucination and they saw Jesus and that's why they talked that Jesus was alive. No, this was no hallucination. He actually ate food. He was real. But again, it says (laughs) they didn't believe. It couldn't get from their eyes to their heart. Now, in both instances, we see a disappointed Savior. Let's go back to that walk to Emmaus. Back to verse 25. Jesus said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in the Scriptures concerning Himself. Warren Wiersbe writes, That was some Bible conference. I wish I could have been there. (laughs) Max Licato adds, Christ conducted a Bible class. He led the Emmaus-bound duo through an Old Testament survey course from the writings of Moses, the messages of Isaiah, Amos, and the others. He turned the Emmaus trail into a biblical timeline, pausing to describe the Red Sea rumbling, Jericho tumbling, King David stumbling. Of special import to Jesus was the Scriptures, what they said about Himself. His face watermarks more Old Testament stories than you might imagine. Jesus is Noah, saving humanity from disaster. Abraham, the father of a new nation. Isaac, placed on the altar by his father. Joseph, being sold for a bag of silver. Moses, calling slaves to freedom. Joshua, pointing out the promised land. Jesus then took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets. Can you imagine Christ quoting Old Testament Scripture? Did Isaiah 53 sound this way? I was wounded and crushed for your sins. I was beaten that you might have peace. Or Isaiah 28, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem. It is a firm, tested, precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Did he pause and give the Emmaus students a wink saying, I'm the stone Isaiah described? We don't know his words, but we do know their impact. The two disciples said, we felt our hearts burning within us while he talked. But what was happening to Jesus while he was saying these words? I imagine his heart was also burning with disappointment. You can almost hear the frustration in his voice in verse 44 and 45. He said to them, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. You see, all of the Old Testament points toward Jesus. And he expected them 
to understand that. I mean, he had told them all along what was going to happen. This wasn't some secret. And the scriptures are filled with allusions to what Jesus would go through. Friday night, we looked at Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 1, you all are familiar with because it was words Jesus used on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you read through that psalm, you'll find no less than nine specific predictions of crucifixion 600 years before crucifixion was even invented and a thousand years before Christ died. Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was on Him. He gave His life as a guilt offering for us. And even in that Isaiah 53, there's allusions to Him rising from the dead. It's there. The gospel is found in the Old Testament. And He says, why didn't you know this? You should have known this. Now, before we get too critical of Cleopas and his partner and the other disciples, let's acknowledge a principle. When our expectations crumble and our dreams fade, it's easy to slide into a funk. Circumstances become our taskmaster. People, especially those who took part in causing our pain, stand taller than God. Our vision becomes earthbound, very horizontal. Our prayers seem to bounce off of the ceiling and God seems very far removed from our pain. Howard Hendricks writes, Whenever I go, I can expect to run into a Christian with a severe case of the blahs. His face looks like the cover photo for the Book of Lamentations. <laughs> I'll say, how are you, man? Oh, pretty good, he says, under the circumstances. And what in the world are you doing under those? But how many of us often live under the circumstances? We're looking at the circumstances instead of the truth. And whenever our view of the way it ought to be doesn't coincide with the circumstances that are going on, we have a question that we are faced with. Are you going to trust in the truth or are you going to trust in the circumstances as you see them? That was the problem of those guys on Emmaus on the road to Emmaus. That was the problem with the twelve. They were looking at things the way they thought it should be, and when it didn't add up, well, what's wrong with this picture? Jesus had given them the truth all along, but they were clinging to the circumstances instead of the truth. As long as we hold on to our own desires and our own perspective, the way we think things ought to be, we're going to be unable to see God, even if He was to stand right before us. And this brings me back to the title of this message, Truth or Circumstances. That's the choice each one of us will make in those difficult times when our dreams are dashed, our hearts are broken, our plans are frustrated. What are we going to lean on then? Are we going to lean on the truth of God's Word or the circumstances in front of us? If we lean on the circumstances, we lose our hope. As Christians, we should never live under the circumstances, no matter how difficult they might be. Now, some say you should live above your circumstances, not under them. The problem is there's no way that you can live above them if they're a part of your life. I think maybe it's more correct to say we should live through them and triumph over them. There is an alternative to living under the circumstances. It's living through them and cutting through them. Surviving and, and even getting stronger because of them. How do we do that? We do that by holding on to God's Word. In the tough times, this is the truth. Not what you're seeing around you. Not what you're hearing on the evening news. Not what you're reading in the paper. Not what people are talking about on social media. This is the truth. And unless we hold to the truth, we're going to be discouraged. We're going to look at the world and say, this doesn't make sense. 
how can this be? God says, you just stick with my truth. And when we hold on to the truth, it will change the way we see everything. Let me encourage you to release your expectations. Hand them over to God. Open your hands to receive what He chooses to place in them. Here's a simple prayer that I've discovered that can be a great help. Lord, I am willing to receive whatever you give, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict, to be what you require. If that's too much to remember, it's all summarized in that prayer of Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. We have the truth of God's Word complete in the Bible. We have the circumstances of life, and they are disappointing at best. Which will we believe? Which will we allow to dictate our behavior? That wasn't just a choice for those disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's a choice that faces us every single day. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we read the accounts of these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, discouraged, ready to give up hope. And we confess that as we look into your word, it's like looking into a mirror. We see ourselves. How often have we been in that same path, walking in those same sandals, allowing the circumstances of life to dictate our vision and our behavior. I pray that we would learn from this passage not to put our hope in circumstances, but to put our hope in the truth of your word. And may that truth transform how we see our circumstances rather than the circumstances changing how we view your truth. Make us bold, make us wise, and help us to go from this place and live in such a way that people see a difference and say, I want to have what you have. And then we can introduce them to Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.